the 1991 Austin Yogurt Chop killings are an unsolved quadruple homicide that happened on Friday, December 6, 1991. At and I can't believe it's yogurt. Shop in Austin, Texas, United States. Four teenage girls were killed Amy Ayers, 13, Eliza Thomas, 17, Jennifer Harbison, 17, and Jennifer's 15 year old sister Sarah. Jennifer and Eliza worked at the shop, and Sarah and her friend Amy were there to catch a ride home with Jennifer after it closed at 11 p.m. A couple who left the shop shortly before 11 p.m. A man who had tried to hustle customers in his queue was allowed to use the toilet in back about an hour before closing time, took a very long time, and may have jammed her ear door open. A couple who left the shop shortly before 11 p.m., when Jennifer locked the front door to prevent more customers from entering, reported seeing two men acting suspiciously at a table. A police officer reported a fire in the shop around midnight, and first responders discovered the girls' bodies inside. Some of the victims had been shot in the head, while others had been raped. The murders were committed with pistol, and the perpetrators most likely exited through a back door that was found unlocked. According to one of the original detectives on the case, the organized method of operation, ability to control the victims, and destruction of evidence by arson pointed to an adult with criminal experience rather than teenagers. As a result of one of the rapes, the Austin Police Department has DNA from an unknown male. A Y chromosome match for the perpetrator DNA was discovered in an FBI research database, but the FBI declined to reveal the man's identity in accordance with the law of donor anonymity. And because thousands of men could bear this fragment of DNA, which is unable to identify individuals. On Friday, December 6, 1991, shortly before midnight, an Austin Police Department patrolman noticed a fire coming from an I can't believe it's yogurt shop and reported it to his dispatcher. Firefighters discovered four naked bodies after extinguishing the fire. Each had been executed by being shot in the head with a .22 caliber lead bullet. Sarah's hands were bound behind her back with a pair of panties, and she was gagged and raped. Jennifer was not restrained, but her hands were tied behind her back. Eliza was gagged and had her hands tied behind her back. All three had been severely burned and shot in the head. Amy's body, unlike the others, was discovered in a different area of the shop. Although she was not charred, she had second and very early third degree burns on 25 to 30 of her body. She was discovered with a sock-like cloth wrapped around her neck. She had been shot in the same place as the others, but the bullet had missed her brain. She also had a second bullet exiting through her lateral cheek and jawline, which had caused severe brain damage. Initial investigations yielded a large number of suspects, including a 15-year-old caught with a .22 in a nearby mall days after the killings. Although he initially provided promising information, Detectives determined that he was attempting to get out of the gun charge and arrested him as well as three petty criminal friends he had implicated, none of whom were older than 17 at the time. There was no record of what was said to the men during the 1991 interrogations, making it impossible to determine whether the detectives provided information to the suspects during the initial interrogations. If the suspects referred to it, such information could be used to implicate them in subsequent interrogations. Two of the four were charged solely because of their self-incriminating statements. The prosecution went into great detail about the atrocities committed against the young victims, but presented no hard evidence other than confessions. The two were convicted, with one sentenced to death and the other sentenced to life in prison due to his age at the time. A new detective on the case several years later theorized that the four teens from 1991 were credible suspects. They were in their 20s at the time. Confessions were obtained from some of the suspects during a series of interrogations conducted by various detectives. They claimed that all four, Robert Springsteen, Michael Scott, Marie Spears, and Forrest Wilburn, were involved in the murder. However, because the co-defendant was not testifying, the prosecution's tactic of using excerpts from each other's alleged confessions at the other's trial was ruled to have violated the Confrontation Clause. Both convictions were overturned solely on the basis of the Confrontation Clause, and the men were released in 2009. The prosecution insisted on a new trial. However, forensic examination revealed that the DNA discovered in a victim was not theirs, nor was it that of the other two individuals named in their confessions. As a result, the prosecution dropped its plans for retrial. Later, 
Texas courts ruled that those who were released were not entitled to compensation because they had not proven they did not commit the crime.